Morning, everybody. Crazy weather, huh? Five degrees tonight. That's not a temperature. <laughs> anyway, so were you a good student in school? I don't mean behavior-wise. I mean, you know, academically. Were you, were you a good student? Because I wasn't. I was a mediocre student. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, uh, I won't go into. But, <laughs> but there is this one uh, reason. Um, I wasn't ever any good at taking notes. I, I just never got the hang of how to take notes well. So I would try to, you know, write everything the teacher or professor was saying and, and capture it all and you know, eventually that, that just doesn't work because um, I get too far behind. Um, I would try and get a major idea and I'd miss it. Um, or the teacher would say something and that would spur a thought and I'd be kind of off on this thought and realize I'd missed a whole bunch of st I was just never any, nobody ever asked me to borrow my notes. That never happened in my academic career. Um, I did learn one thing um, as a technique. I, again, I wasn't very good at it, but I, there was this technique that I heard of listen for cues or, or tells that the professor will give you um, that will indicate this is something you need, to, you need to capture, you need to write down because you'll probably see it later. So if the professor, for example, said, you know, I find this interesting, that was, that was an indicator that maybe I should write that down. Or, um, this is really important, so I'd write that down. Or my favorite, this will be on the test. <laughs> I'd write it down. Beyond that, I was not very good at it. The Apostle Paul, in writing his first letter to the church in Corinth, was dealing with a whole lot of stuff, uh, some really heavy stuff. Um, he was kind of irritated with, with this church for some very good reason. And so he's, he's writing them a letter, and he's, there's a lot of heavy theology in it and instruction about, you know, behavior and so forth. And um, so by the 11th chapter, he's now addressing public worship. And he's actually having to say things like, when you get together for the Lord's Supper, it's not right that some of you are bringing so much food that you're gorging yourselves while others are too poor to even have some bread. That's not good. It's also not good to get drunk on the wine at communion. He actually had to write that down. By chapter 12... He's talking about giftedness, and he's saying that God, through the Spirit, has given each of you a gift, and uh, describing what those gifts are, and that the church then is like a body, like a human body. Each of us has a part. Each part is unique, but when they work in a coordinated way, um, it's, like a, it's like the human body. It's, it's a good thing. And, uh, you know, so by, by the 12th chapter, you know, if Jeff would be sitting at his desk, you know, spacing out, I'm sure. And, but then comes this tell. At the end of the 12th chapter, Paul wrote this. And now I will show you the most excellent way. Like, okay, you've got my attention now. He's going to show us, he's going to tell us about the most excellent way. I'm sitting up now. He's got my attention. I've got my pen out. I'm ready. What is the most excellent way? And 13 opens up. Chapter 13 opens up. And Paul begins to describe the nature of love. And it is the most profound and thorough description of the nature of love that you will ever come across. I have read countless things about love. Really interesting things, really pithy kinds of things, but there is nothing more profound or complete a description than the 13th chapter of the book of Corinthians about the nature of love. And I know that, you know, it's one of those because it's at every wedding that you've probably ever been to, that it's like, oh, there it is again. 
If I say, the couple's doing their, ah. you're zoned out, you're checking out people's, whatever. It's, it's, it gets lost in that, right? We've been doing a study, it's starting back uh, in the fall, uh, a series of series under the overall heading of the way, the way of Jesus. And we are now wrapping up that series with this three-part series on the nature of love. Because we can't talk about the way of Jesus without talking specifically about love. It's inherent in the whole thing. Jesus talked about love. Paul talked about love. And the importance, the central importance of love. The way I would condense it down in terms of what Paul and Jesus were trying to say is love is the point. Love is the point. Like, everything else is a sub-point to love. Paul wrote in this profound description, the 13th chapter of the book of Corinthians. And he started this description of love by saying, if you have the eloquence of language of human beings and angels, if you have all knowledge and can understand all mysteries, if you are willing to sacrifice your own body for someone else, but you fail at love, you failed the course. Love is the point. And so if our faith is missing love, if our understanding of Christ is missing love, if our daily living is missing love, we've missed the point and we have failed. It's sort of like, you know, chicken cordon bleu. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> I just wanted to see if you were awake. Um, it, so, you know, you, you could take, get all the right herbs and spices and have, you know, the cheese laid out and this nice ham and you cook it for exactly the right amount of time at exactly the right temperature. You do it all right, but you don't have the chicken. You've got chicken cordon, ooh, not chicken cordon. It, you missed the point, right? Faith in Christ without love is like chicken cordon blue without the chicken. Thank you. <laughs> it's heavy. That's heavy. All right. So. Paul ends that chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, with this. Therefore, these three remain. You know what they are? You do know. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Why? Why does he say that the greatest of these is love? And so for years, when I would read that, I'd... I'd puzzle about, you know, like, maybe he's just using hyperbole here, he's just trying to make a, a, a bold statement, and uh, because faith is really, really important, right? Hope is, we like hope here, right? you know, we think hope is really, really important. Why is he saying that the greatest is love? And it wasn't until 10 or so years ago, in my world, everything is 10 years ago or yesterday. It, like, it's... <laughs> I don't have any sense of time anymore. <laughs> so it was either 10 years ago or yesterday, but um, I was studying this passage, and one of the commentators finally helped me understand. He wrote that 
the reason Paul says that love is the greatest is because love is the only one that's forever. I mean, think about it, right? One day when you leave this life, you will stand in the presence of God and you will no longer need faith. And when you are standing in the presence of God, you will no longer need hope, this expectation of that which is to come. So in the presence of God, there is no need for faith, there is no need for hope, there is only love. So that's what Paul had to say on, on love. We're talking about the way of Jesus, so let's look at what Jesus had to say. Um, and Jesus had a lot to say about love. I want to look at just one passage this morning. Um, it's in three of the Gospels. I'm just looking at uh, the Gospel of Mark this morning. It's from the 12th chapter. It's verses 28 to 31. And uh, so the words will be on the screen. Obviously, if you have your own Bible or it's on your device, feel free to follow along on that. One of the teachers of religious law was standing there listening to the debate. He realized that Jesus had answered well. So he asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. Jesus boiled it down. The whole law and all of the prophets to these two things that share in common love. He calls us th to a three-dimensional love. Love for God, love for neighbor, love for self. And so over the next three weeks, we're going to look at the three-dimensional aspect of love. And even though I'm going to be looking at each one kind of individually, starting this morning with God, understand that they are interwoven together. You can't really love God and not love your neighbor and not learn to love yourself. You can't really love your neighbor and not yourself and God. And so there's this inner weaving of these three things. And so while I'll be looking at each one kind of individually, inherent in all three, are the other two. Jesus said that, right? The first is love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Second is like it. They're connected. Love your neighbor as yourself. So, it starts with loving God loving God. You know, anytime I read in the Bible about heaven, what picture is usually described is God seated on a throne, surrounded by a heavenly host, right? Uh, angels and archangels and cherubim and cherubim and um, you know, so these, these great beings and they are all worshiping God. And the, the, you understand that these images that are in Scripture are the attempts to describe that which is eternal to that which is temporal. So I don't think these are exact descriptions that there's going to be a big chair and, you know, God with a flowing robe and a big beard and so forth. I, I don't think that's what it's actually going to look like. I may be wrong. I may get up there and go, wow, it really does look like that. Um, but the description of all heaven worshiping God is what's intriguing. 
And the thing is, I don't think it's happening because God has a big ego and needs to be uh, worshipped like that. What I think is happening is the natural response to perfect love. When you are standing in the presence of perfect love, perfect truth, fully known and fully accepted and loved, the natural response, you couldn't help but fall to your knees and worship this one. Just totally free, at liberty, fully accepted. You know, no longer facades, no longer fears and worries about this, that, or the next thing. And that's the nature of the worship. It's not worship because we have to worship. You know, like, oh my gosh, for some people, they think about heaven, and they, they hear about worship like that, and they think, oh my God, for eternity? Like, ugh, it's like being in church 24-7 forever? Not that there's anything wrong with that. Right? But no, it's, it's not that. It's, it's just this overwhelming response to that which you are in the presence of. It's not that you have to, it's that you can't help but worship. I was sharing at the first service, you know, it's, uh, we're at the end of the football season. Actually, it ended last week. Um, <laughs> but apparently there are a couple other games yet to happen. Um, there's something about Eagles fans, right? We have this national reputation uh, for, for being, you know, Deeply devout fans. People in this region love their team in ways that not every city loves their professional football team. And it's not because you have to. It's not, you know, if you're going to live in Philly, you must worship the Eagles and blah, blah, blah. You know, it's not that way. It's, it's people just feel this connection to, uh, to that team. And it's not even about individuals, you know. Players come and players go and so forth. They, but people love the the team and they will travel places to watch them play there are times where there are it seems as many philadelphia fans in a stadium in another city as there are home fans if other cities find it annoying <laughs> but that's the nature of the love that people have for for that team Right? They do it out of a sense of devotion, loyalty, love for the team. Now, the difference, of course, between the eagles and God is the eagles really won't do anything for you. It's fun to watch, but they're not really going to change your life, and it's not forever. Just saying. Okay. So I want to get practical. We're saying that our calling, our first calling, is to love God. How do you do that? Well, with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. All your heart. So heart is the emotions, is what's being described there when it talks about your heart. It's not the physical organ, right? It's your emotions. To love God with all of your emotions. David, in the Psalms, writes um, emotively about his love for God. Let us worship the Lord. Let us come into his presence with gladness. Come before him with songs. You know, it's this description of these expressions of love for God, song and uh, great expressions of love for God. Sometimes when I'm here for worship, I feel this overwhelming sense, you know, when the, when the worship band is, is leading us in worship and the music is swelling and, and the words are speaking to me in a deep way, I, I just kind of get lost in the moment. And there are times where I, I actually get goosebumps and um, sometimes it, it's a smile and sometimes it's, it's tears, although I think it's allergies, but it's, you know... <laughs> 
uh, this overwhelming sense of emotion, right? And in those times, you know, I, it, sometimes I just can't help. I raise my hands, you know. It, that's weird, right? Only weird people do that. Right? That's not true, right? And, um, so um, we want you to feel free to express yourself emotionally when you're in worship. It's okay to do that. If somebody's doing that and it's not your thing, don't judge them. We're called to love God with our emotions. But joy and laughter and, and that, you know, kind of tingly, that's not the only emotions, right? There's also anger and sadness and disappointment and fear. Those are emotions as well. And we can love God in those emotions. David did as well. As you read the Psalms, there are times where David is expressing great irritation with God, great anger at God, great disappointment in God. Where are you? But he's expressing it. Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 says part of the nature of love is that love never gives up. So even when you feel frustrated, angry, disappointed in God, as we all do from time to time, to not give up. David would say, and at the end of one of those tirades, tantrums uh, in the Psalms, he would often end it by saying, and yet I still trust in your unfailing love. Despite all of this, I still trust in your unfailing love. I'm not leaving. So we love God with our whole heart, all of our emotions. We love God with our whole mind, the intellect. Being a Christian, being a follower of Christ, does not require turning off your brain. We're called to love God with our intellect. The reason that we read the scriptures and study the scriptures and try to understand the scriptures is because we want to love God with our intellect, our mind. We want to know and understand who God is and how God works, and so we spend that time. But it's not exclusively about scripture. As we study other disciplines, as we study science and math and architecture and music and social sciences and so forth, as we, as we study these other things, we can gain insights into the nature of God and who God is and how God works. Knowledge is, is our friend. It's not, it's not the enemy of faith. But we need knowledge and wisdom. And wisdom Godly wisdom comes when we ask for it. Scripture says we should ask for wisdom. So yeah, pursue knowledge, but also ask God for wisdom to know what to do with that knowledge. So we love through our emotions, we love through our intellect, we love through our soul. Interesting word, the Greek word soul is um, psyche. Psyche where we get our word psychology. It's about that which animates our physical body. Right? So you know that you are more than just this physical body, I hope, right? When this body stops functioning, we are not, who we are is not dead. It's freed from that body. We call it in our uh, Modern parlance, we might refer to it as our personality. The word could literally be translated breath. It's the essence of who you are. Love God with the essence of who you are. I love the translation, uh, the message, what, what Peterson does with this verse. He says, we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart with all of our intellect with all of our prayer he translates soul into prayer because it is that way in which we express who we are to god all of our 
soul, and all of our strength. And our strength, it's not just about our physical strength, uh, it's about the things that you are particularly good at, the things that you would consider your strengths, whatever they might be. You might be, have strengths in uh, administration, or you might have strengths in teaching, you might have strengths in caring for other people, you might have strengths of leadership, whatever they might be, those strengths can be used to express your love to God if you use them in ways to honor God. So that's how we love God. The question I want to close with is how do you express your love for God with your heart, with your mind, with your soul, with your strength. It's the one thing that is going to last forever. So it's probably worth some investment of your time, wouldn't you say? So how are you going to expand this year, let's make it really practical. How are you going to expand this year your expression of love for God? Heart, mind, soul, strength. As I've been thinking about that, and I had an advantage because I've been thinking about this. This is new information for you, but um, how am I going to do that? And so there are two specific things that I'm going to look to expand in my expression of my love for God this year. One is, is the mind, and so I'm going to be um, developing a next-level discipline in spending time in Scripture and, um, and understanding Scripture. So, you know, it's part of what I do, but, but um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to expand the amount of time that I invest in that over the course of a week and a month. And the second one for me is soul, so prayer. I'm going to expand my prayer life. Um, and one of the specific ways I've, I'm going to be doing that is I'm going to be praying for every household um, that is a part of this church, every person who's a part of this church that we have record of. And so every Wednesday morning, um, I'm going to pray specifically for 25 uh, households until I get through all of them. And I'm going to send out a card the week before I'm going to pray for your household. And just let you know, hey, next Wednesday I'm going to be praying for you. If you have any specific requests for prayer, here's my email address. Shoot me a note and I will include that in my prayer. Um, it'll be a confidential email, of course. Um, so that's just one, uh, two of the ways that I want to expand my expression of my love for God who I am going to be loving forever. So what is it for you? One last thing. In order to do that, I've got to create some time. Right? I don't have a lot of extra time right now. Like I'm not walking around going, i got four hours, I don't know what to do with. Anybody? That's probably the same for you. Right? You probably don't have a lot of time. So I'm going to have to stop doing some things in order to do this other important thing. I was heard on the news uh, this past week, you know the average American looks at his or her phone 47 times a day? We look at our phones 47 times a day. The average time spent on our phones is three and a half hours every day. The average, three and a half hours. Now, I know there's a lot of stuff on the phone. You know, there's, it, it's, you know, email and texting and some actually use it as a phone, I understand. Um, and there's, you know, you, you've got games, you've got apps, and you've got stuff, you know, notifications that are coming at you all the time. Um, maybe there's a way to do that better. Maybe there's some time to be found there. I don't know what it is for you. But to find 
some extra time to exercise a specific discipline as an expression of your love for God is probably going to be time well spent. Let's stand together for closing prayer. So God, we are overwhelmed when we think about forever, when we think about being loved forever, when we think about being in the presence of perfect love forever. And we can get so caught up in the struggles and hurts and aggravations and hardships of this life that we lose sight of you. So I pray, God, that you would inspire us anew as we begin this new year to look to you, to know you better, to love you more fully with the expectation that it will be a blessing to us and time well spent. I pray these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey, have a great week. Be careful out there.